Hi, this is my week two video. Uh, so this week we talked a lot about mental health and how um, things like discrimination and other systems of oppression like racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, um, ableism, ageism, sort of play into this sort of intersectionality of, of discrimination. And, you know, when we're, when we talk about mental health and mental health disparities, you know, in the LGBTQ population, it's, it's very, very complex because, um, as we can see from, from, you know, articles from Pompey Lee et al., um, you know, bisexual folks, for example, are in a unique place because they uh, not only receive discrimination uh, from, you know, the heterosexual mainstream sort of culture, but they also receive a lot of discrimination and ostracization from the heterosexual uh um, communities. So I think, you know, when we think about mental health and we think about mental health in, in and among the LGBTQ population, I think we really have to think strongly about this notion of identity and how, uh, language is a tool that's used to self-identify. So, you know, kind of, Using an, an example, um, you know, I'm someone who is, is white. Um, you know, I identify as genderqueer, but I present very male, um, and uh, I'm I'm male bodied. Um, and it took me a long time to sort of come to this this notion of acknowledging privilege. Um, being white, being male, being heterosexual is a very prestigious and, and privileged position and identity to be in, in today's society. And I think, you know, in, in terms of the bisexual and even transgender communities, we think of things like marriage equality and, and um, anti-discrimination laws as being huge successes, which they are, you know, marriage equality is, is a wonderful, um, achievement that we, we got in 2015. Um, but there's a lot of work to do. And I think a lot of people fail to realize that though we have these sorts of recognitions, um, there is still a lot of discrimination and a lot of health inequities for our transgender uh, friends of color, um, our genderqueer friends, um, our bis bisexual friends. Um, you know, identity, like I said last week, is is an inherent part of this whole discussion of mental health. Um, and the LGBTQ population and sort of the, the discriminations that we face. Um, I think it's really important to, you know, I like this study by Simmons because it talked about the transgender youth population and how it's really important that we sort of study certain populations like the transgender populations separately from the lesbian, gay, and bisexual populations. Health disparities um, and health outcomes are different of course, for transgender folks versus white, gay, male folks. And I think it's very important, uh, you know, this notion of, of parental support, family support, you know, social social groups and social support is, you know, a, a backbone for um, positive mental health. And, you know, the bisexual community, like I said, uh, faces this sort of double-edged sword of receiving a lot of discrimination, not only from straight heterosexual culture, uh, heteronormative culture, but also homosexual culture in that, you know, their, their, um, uh, social support networks might be a little limited because they have this sort of, you know, in between existence of receiving discrimination from sort of both sides of the spectrum of the gay and straight spectrum. And it, it, it's not like that for all folks. Not all folks, of course, identify on the, the gender binary. You know, a lot of folks use the he or he, him or she, her pronouns. You know, they identify as male and or female. And, and, um, that's how it's been, you know, that's what has been sort of normal in our culture for, for 
an unlimited amount of time almost. And so we, we we're at a point where the gender queer and the transgender community are under a lot of pressure. Um, they're getting killed in the streets. Um, you know, transgender people of color, you know, are at a high risk of violence, sexual victimization, um, rape and, or, um, you know, gun violence and or being killed. So I think when we look at mental health, we can't use, you know, an umbrella for all members of the LGBTQ population. It, it's different. It Mental health disparities are, are different for all of these groups. And I think, you know, what, what Haas and, and the others said about um, you know, risk factors for suicidal behavior, it's, it's going to be different, um, you know, for, for all of us, uh, what we experience, what the sort of pressures are, what these systems of oppression are. So I think in looking at mental health with the LGBTQ population, we need to think about intersectionality. We need to think about how the system of oppressions, systems of oppression like, you know, homophobia, transphobia, ageism. We have a lot of folks who are older and gay that receive a lot of discrimination in long-term care facilities. Um, ableism. We have a lot of folks that, you know, have chronic illnesses or infectious, infectious illnesses, um, you know, such as the HIV positive population, um, being HIV, HIV positive is very difficult in today's society because we have a lot of legal, um, discrimination against folks who are HIV positive, but we also have a lot of social discrimination. We think of people with HIV as being folks that we need to stay away from or not have sex with. And it's really, you know, traumatic and hurtful to those folks to constantly feel like, well, what I have, what, what I, what I'm, identifying as or what I have, such as HIV or any other sort of chronic illness, um, is, is something that I, a lot of people can't help. You know, once you have HIV, of course, you have it um, for life. So where are we going to sort of break down these barriers? Where are we going to break down this discrimination? Because a white cisgendered gay male in today's society is still much more privileged than a trans person of color or an HIV positive person. And of course that carries into, you know, access to healthcare, access to mental health care. Um, and of course all kinds of other barriers, you know, being able to pay for these things. So I think when we look at mental health, when we look at LGBTQ health, we need to think about intersectionality because, it's different for everybody. And we see that in the readings. We see discrimination and prejudice afflicting bisexual people much differently, transgender people much differently. And this is not to say that, you know, gay, uh, cisgendered male folks don't receive discrimination because they do daily. Um, but we really need to sort of take into consideration language and how people use language as a tool to identify Identity plays into mental health just as it does into all the other forms of health, other, you know, systems that we look at. And um, it's imperative that we use language carefully um, to sort of break down these these stigmas and these stereotypes. And, and I think, you know, future research will really have to take into account intersectionality, but also take into account language and the importance that it is in, in how the LGBTQ population exists. I mean, it's such, the LGBTQ is an umbrella term. We use it a lot to sort of classify studies, classify groups of communities. But when we break apart these communities, when we, when we break them down into the next sort of level of what a bisexual person's uh, lived experience is versus a uh, 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 heterosexual female's, uh, you know, existence is, it's very different. And so mental health um, requires looking at intersectionality and it requires um, careful examination of language. So 
um, just wanted to do another video this week. Hope you all have a good um, long weekend and happy Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Have a good weekend. Thank you.